This section heading is called Locally Reflected Cross-Site Scripting. So what we're going to do in this section is we're going to demonstrate a locally reflected cross-site scripting attack. We're going to discuss what it means to be susceptible to cross-site scripting and also highlight the attributes of what makes it locally reflected. So the first thing that we're going to need to do is to establish an SSH session with the back end. Now if you're continuing on from the previous section then you would already have one established. So once we get on here we're going to review the PHP code that made our site susceptible to HTML injections. So we're going to be using the stream editor once again to do this and a review of the syntax real quick just like we highlighted inside of chapter 4 is we're using the dash n option to disable auto printing of the whole file within the terminal and we're only going to print what is denoted by the p command over here which is lines 9 through 17. Now the PHP code that I'm referring to is inside of our custom home page which is down the following path and is in this following file. So here's the file name. So here is that PHP code. Now inside of chapter 4 we highlighted that the vulnerability existed because we weren't properly securing the input to our request function over here. So our request function not properly secured therefore this is the vulnerability. Also highlighted inside of chapter 4 was the fact that the security community actually told you to shy away from using this function because of the multitude of ways that you could actually define the variable my username over here. So now this vulnerability made our site susceptible to HTML injections but what we're going to find in this section is that it also makes it susceptible to cross-site scripting. So we're going to minimize the terminal and then going over to the browser what we're going to do is we're going to review my browser search history. So I'm going to type yourbank.com or start to type it and what you can see down here is where I performed an HTML injection and then up here a cross-site scripting attack. Now in the HTML injections lab we use the git method to actually define the variable my username inside of the URL or inside of the browser. So what meant that our site was susceptible to HTML injections was the fact that our input element over here was allowed to be rendered and actually display an input field on the web page. So now if we compare this up here. So the most common programming language used in a cross-site scripting attack is JavaScript. So now what makes it or what means that a site is susceptible to cross-site scripting basically means that the JavaScript over here is going to be allowed to execute. So we can click this and we can see it execute. If we look at the JavaScript that's actually supplied up here, what you're going to notice is that it looks very similar to HTML and in fact it's actually structured the same way. So we call this a script element and then we have the content in between. Now your JavaScript was created to invoke or developed for kind of like that user interaction. So over here we can see that user interaction where it's actually looking for us to click OK in this box. So we've got the script element, we've got the content in between, which is an alert method, which is meant to open up an alert box, and again, user interaction. So if we click OK, what we're going to do is right click and view the page source. So if the JavaScript, if the end user supplies JavaScript and it is allowed to execute, then the site is susceptible to cross-site scripting. But then what makes this a locally reflected cross-site scripting attack as opposed to other cross-site scripting attacks? Well, it's basically the attributes. So which means the attributes being the insertion occurred on the client side file and no other. And then that alert box displayed information back to the local user and no other. So both of those are attributes of a locally reflected cross-site scripting attack. So now one other thing that I want to review here. If you execute this one more time, notice that we see the word Jurbank and then we don't see the rest of the web page, but we do see the JavaScript over here that's being executed. And that basically has to do with the way how your script is read in sequentially. So we come down to the title element. The title element gets rendered and we can see the word your bank in the upper left. It gets down to the JavaScript. The JavaScript executes. It waits for that end user interaction for them to respond. And once they respond, only then does it render the rest of the HTML. 